Now, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome uh, to the latest in the EPA climate change lectures. Um, you're very welcome. Um, and welcome, indeed, to the historic round, round room uh, of the Mansion House. And whether you're here with us in person this evening in such numbers or uh, watching us through uh, the World Wide Web, you're equally welcome. And many of you I know have been with us before uh, at this uh, EPA uh, lecture series, but there are many newcomers also tonight. Uh, my name is John Bowman. It's my pleasure to be your chairperson for this evening. Our lecturer this evening is uh, Dr. Arthur uh, Ranger Metzger, who since January 2016 has been director at the Directorate General for Climate Action with the European Commission. And before, um, before Laura Burke introduces him, uh, there are some small housekeeping announcements which you're familiar with. Um, the exits are as marked uh, in this round room, and I would ask you to switch off mobile phones. Uh, I call now upon Laura Burke, who is Director General of the Environmental Protection Agency, to introduce our speaker. Good evening, and uh, thank you very much for, for coming on a, on a February uh, evening to uh, our latest of the EPA climate lectures. And this is the first climate lecture that we have of 2020. And of course, I'd like to also welcome uh, all of you who are joining online this evening as it's also been uh, live streamed to the web, as John mentioned. So firstly, I would really like to thank our guest speaker, Arthur Rung Metzger, as I massacre your name, Arthur, apologies, um, for accepting the invitation to present this evening in what promises to be engaging, thought-provoking, and I think really timely lecture uh, for all of us. And of course, I'd also like to thank John Bowman uh, for chairing uh, tonight's event. And I think those of you who've been to any number of these lectures would agree that the EPA climate lecture wouldn't be a climate lecture if it wasn't for John and his, uh, his brilliant way of chairing and guiding us through the evening. I should also mention that the lecture series is part of Ireland's national dialogue on climate action and that the aim of the dialogue is to create awareness, engagement, enhance motivation, uh, ultimately to act to address climate change. But of course, uh, the EPA lecture series predates the dialogue. Uh, it started back in 2008. And uh, I suppose, so in a way, we were ahead of our time in the context of engagement and dialogue, but ultimately, it provided an important uh, foundation for the climate dialogue process. So what we're here this evening really to talk about is the European Green Deal, and that is the flagship program for the new European Commission. It was the first policy paper provided by the new president of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, and it is challenging and inspiring, and it brings environment, climate, and the circular economy into the heart of EU planning and development. A key pillar of the Green Deal is to make Europe the first climate neutral continent by 2050. So very significant ambition. And of course, this at once reflects what science tells us is needed if we are to meet the goals of the Paris Agreement, to keep the global temperature increase well below 2 degrees, and to make efforts to limit the increase to 1.5 degrees. And this requires major transformation and modernization of key elements of the European economy, and of course, national economy, and to make sure that we leave nobody behind. And I think that's really familiar to us in the context of discussions we've been having in Ireland around the just transition. The Green Deal will cover a broad array of EU policies in the fields of climate, energy, industry, mobility, agriculture and forestry, environment, sustainable finance, investments, taxation, as well as external relations, including trade. So it is all encompassing. And the supports and systems to enable this to happen are essential. Um, and these are also essential if we are to get the buy-in and engagement of all of us as citizens of Europe. So I'm delighted that Arthur uh, is 
has travelled to Ireland tonight and taken time out of his busy schedule um, to talk to us. Um, and as John said, um, we're really privileged to have Arthur speaking to us this evening. He's director at DG Climate Action, dealing with European and international climate strategies and the governance of EU climate action. And prior to that, he led on international climate negotiations, including for the 2015 Paris Agreement. He holds a doctoral degree in agricultural economics from the University of Göttingen, um, so very relevant uh, to Irish discussions on climate, and of course has a deep knowledge of climate policy. So I'm sure we're all looking forward to his presentation. Um, and before I hand over back to John, I should say if you want to get involved electronically, please do so on Twitter using hashtag climatelecture2020. And of course, the presentation, along with being broadcast live, will be uploaded to the EPA web pages as an enduring national and international education resource alongside all of the previous lectures we've had over the last 12 years. So with that, I'd like to thank you, and, and I'll hand back over to John to start the evening session. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Laura. Uh, the lecture and the questions and answers uh, are being recorded, as Laura mentioned, by the EPA and will be made available on the EPA Ireland YouTube channel uh, following on from the event and may, may be used for, by the EPA for future communications. The format is the lecture will be approximately 40 minutes, followed by a questions and answers session, uh, and I'm asking questioners to identify themselves. We're also accepting questions uh, via Twitter using hashtag climatelecture2020. Uh, our guest lecturer's presentation will tell us about the European Green Deal, so would you please welcome Dr. Runger Metzer um, for his presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lara, for the nice words. Um, and this is a fantastic room. I can't see anybody, though, but <laughs> it's still a fantastic room. And it's a very historic venue, I hear. And I must say, I love speaking in historic venues mm -hmm. about something that hopefully is going to become um, something that is going to be changing our lives, changing our societies, changing our economies, the European Green Deal, taking Europe towards climate neutrality by the year 2050. So what's the starting point of this? The starting point is what we all are experiencing almost every day around us, that the world is changing, the climate is changing, and we see impacts on our economies whether it's agricultural yields, whether it is forests, trees that are drying up, um, but also impacts on the energy sector, impacts on the transport sector. Um, when the water levels were low two years ago, the ships couldn't bring the iron ore up the Rhine River, nor could they bring down any kind of chemicals to the customers. So it has direct economic impacts on today's Europe, on today's society. And all of this is happening while temperature, global average temperature has only been rising by one degree Celsius over the last hundreds of years. And if you look into the IPCC, the report of the International Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, it's going to go up to 1.5 degrees sometime between 2040 and 2050 two degrees sometimes be, um, between 2060, 2070. So that means a doubling of the temperature, and I think everybody can estimate what could be the impacts on our society. And it's then no longer only the economy, it might also be the security. And my colleagues who work in the field of development say already today there's many people moving in the world because of climate change, because parts of the world become uninhabitable. So what do we need to do? Of course, one thing is to adapt, but we will not be able to adapt probably to an ever-increasing warming climate. So we'll have to tackle 
the causes, the root causes of climate change, and everybody in the room knows that's about greenhouse gas emissions. So what is the vision for Europe in the coming 30 years when we talk, yes, we should become climate neutral? Just look at where we end up in the year 2050. You will see there, there are still emissions in 2050 because in some sectors it's going to be very, very hard or almost impossible to reduce the emissions. Like, for instance, in agriculture, because you can't forbid cows to do what they are doing. But we might also have to still fly planes on kerosene to a certain extent by the year 2050. So what we can do is to balance those emissions with what we call removals. And there's two ways of doing it. One is you do it in the biological way, in the natural way. So take the plants, the trees that grab CO2 from the atmosphere and they store it. Or you use the soils, where you can also increase the carbon content of soils. Or the other possibility is to use te new technologies like carbon capture and storage to put carbon and CO2 back into a geological strata. So in the year 2050, we will have to achieve that balance that would make it net zero greenhouse gas emissions. And that's what we call climate neutral by the year 2050. When you then see what it means for the different sectors, I think you see that all sectors of the economy will have to contribute. They will have to reduce their emissions. And just look at the yellow part, that is the energy sector, where we would have to decarbonize Europe already by the year 2040. And many of the technologies we will need then, we already know today, whether it is wind onshore or offshore, whether it's solar energy, or whether it's other forms of energy that do not lead to the emission of greenhouse gases. That has to be done by the year 2040. But also the other sectors, whether it's transport, whether it's industry, will have to contribute. And I think in most cases, we know today what these technologies are. And we can estimate what the costs of these technologies are. And we can, from that estimate, what is the investment going to be in these types of technologies. Very clearly, there is like seven big areas where we know these technologies. And we know what needs to happen is that we need to increase investments in these in the deployment of these technologies. And here we talk about 150, 270, up to 270 billion euros in additional investment every year. That's about around 2% of our GDP in Europe that we will have to invest into the economy in addition in order to get to a climate neutral Europe by the year 2050. That's a huge amount of money. But what it also means is that if you invest into the economy in the different sectors, that this is going to create growth for the future and prosperity. And I think Mrs. von der Leyen is very clear that this Green Deal that follows on this strategy is going to be the new growth strategy for Europe. And at the same time, we are going to reduce our emissions. And this is what has happened already since 1990. We have been growing our GDP by 60%, and we have been reducing our emissions by 24%. And in the coming 30 years, we want to continue along those paths. The European Green Deal is practically the first chapter in order to get there. The European Green Deal wants to design a set of really deeply transformative policies. These are the policies that are going to matter for all the different sectors. It also means that one will have to mainstream sustainability into all EU policies. And we have to find ways on how to finance the transition. Because one thing is to devise policies and make proposals what needs to be done. But we need to become practical. We need to move towards investments. And what we also need to do is to make sure that nobody is left behind, that we have a transition that is going to be just. And I think we shouldn't make a mistake here. This is going to be a huge transformation that is ahead of us. 
it's at the scale that we have not seen in Europe. Even if we think back to the fall of the Iron Curtain and the transformation that happened in the Central and Eastern European countries, or even if we think of the Second World War and how we had to rebuild Europe after the war. I think these are, I think, transformations that have taken place that we should think of in terms of the future. As I said, the plan is, and this is a plan, the European Green Deal, to really touch upon all the different sectors. Um, and Laura, you have mentioning them already, uh, whether it is energy, whether it's the climate policy, whether it's mobility, and I'll take you through them, but not in all the last details. I'll try to highlight just a few big ticket things that are coming up. All these things are going to be tackled or addressed over the coming 18 to 24 months uh, in terms of producing new programs, in terms of investment, in terms of producing new legislation that will have to be discussed in Council and in Parliament. So let's start with the climate side. Uh, the first piece of legislation that you will see proposed is going to be at the beginning of March. It's a European climate law for the first time ever that we would have a climate law in Europe. And it's there in order to make sure that the long-term objective, climate neutrality by 2050, is going to become a legal obligation upon the European Union and its member states. So that this is something that cannot be changed from one day to the other, even if we would have a change in government in Europe. What it will also need to have is a little government's governance structure attached to it, because even if we say climate neutrality by 2050, we need to know how are we going to get there in the coming decades. And we might have to review and look at the trajectories over time so that process of review and improvement will have to be attached to that as well. So this should be there by the beginning of March, and then it's going to go into Council and Parliament, uh, who are the co-legislators in Europe, to turn this into law. The second thing that we will see is that we need to think backwards from 2050 and say what we are having today and we have just gone through the entire energy and climate legislation over the past four years in order to enshrine our at least 40%, our pledge for Paris, whether that is still at the right level. And Mrs. von der Leyen has said that she will look at at least minus 50% emission reductions by 2030 or even 55% emission reductions by 2050, uh, by 2030. And that is quite a step up, um, because as I said in the beginning, today we are at around 23, 24% reductions since 1990. The current plan is minus 40%, so that's a difference of 15 percentage points. And now we would add another 15 percentage points if we were to go to 55%. So it's a doubling of the level of ambition compared to what Europe promised in Paris. That's quite a significant step up, because we all know that if you double the level of ambition, you will have to more than double the effort in order to get there. So this is a huge task ahead of us. The plan of the Commission is in the next weeks and months to look at what are the options to get us there in Europe, in the different sectors, in the different member states. And before we come to Glasgow, the uh, next COP, to provide a plan to the public in Europe that would say these are the possible avenues in order to get to 50 or 55 percent. And on the basis of that, we would start redrafting European legislation. And that is not only the European emissions trading system, it's also for the sectors outside, it's for the land use, it's for the car standards, it's for the energy efficiency standards, it's for the renewable energy standards we have in Europe, we will have to look at everything is going to go back onto the block in order to see how we can deliver on an increased ambition by the year 2030. This all will, of course, be subject to a democratic process uh, because Council and Parliament will have to 
co-legislate about these new laws. But we will go further. We will also look at European energy taxation. Um, if we look into different member states' taxation systems, we still see kind of hidden subsidies for fossil fuels here and there. We see very different ways in that energy is um, taxed at the present point in time. Um, for instance, electricity receives very high levels of taxation. While when we go to clean electricity is the question, are we not pricing electricity out of the market? We will need more electricity in future, not less electricity in order to make our economy more efficient. What we will also have to look at is, what does it mean for European industry? Um, are the products that the industry uh, is going to produce going to be more expensive than what other countries in the world produce? Look at a ton of steel that is produced in a clean way that is going to be more expensive than a ton of dirty steel that might be produced somewhere outside. So how can we make sure that this will not lead to the relocation of European industry, uh, which would mean just reshuffling the emissions from one part of the world to another part of the world, which would make no sense when you look at the objectives of the Paris Agreement. So this is something that we will have to try to avoid. And therefore, we are looking very seriously at what is called a carbon border adjustment mechanism. Finally, we all know that at one degree Celsius, and if that continues to rise, our societies will also have to adapt to the climate change that is going to happen in order to reduce the damage, in order to make sure that we are being prepared. So also a new strategy on adaptation uh, will come out in 2020 or the year 2021. I spoke already a little bit about energy, energy efficiency and renewables. Um, we will also look at the national plans on energy and climate, uh, where most of the versions have come in. The one for Ireland is still under preparation, and I hope the new government is going to endorse it very soon so that we also get a copy in Brussels. Um, but what we, I also is important in terms of getting to climate neutrality is that we start integrating the energy sector with the industrial sector. Um, that we look at how can we electrify the economy in a better way. Uh, what else do we need in terms of electricity, uh, like green hydrogen, like synthetic fuels, which you can produce by using uh, clean electricity. So therefore, we will come up with a strategy for a smart sector integration particularly looking what are the challenges here for European infrastructure. And that's, again, not only the infrastructure related to electricity, it's also the gas grid that is there, because also the gas grid can um, transport decarbonized gas, whether it is hydrogen or other forms of gas, in the future. One of the biggest headaches in the energy sector, and I think you know that very well, everybody who lives in a house somewhere that is older than um, kind of 10 or 15 years, that our houses in Europe are not really energy efficient. And if you look at the renovation rates over the last years, it is hovering around 1%, which means every building is going to be renovated once in 100 years but we need to have a clean building stock by the year 2050. So there's only 30 years left. Um, therefore, in the Commission, we are preparing what is called a renovation wave in order to try to increase, to double the renovation rates in Europe and to assist member states who are drafting at the moment also strategies in that area to move this forward. And that will have to do with um, financing, that will have to do also with upskilling many of the skills of our workers in the building and construction sector. But that will also have to do um, with um, recycling uh, in the construction sector a lot of the materials in order to move forward. Coming to industry, I think this is one of the sectors that is going to be very difficult um, if you look away from the energy-related emissions in industry 
uh, where we know what the technologies are going to be. But if you look at process emissions, <clears throat> just look at steel for a moment, um, where we need a lot of coal and today in order to reduce iron ore to turn that into steel. And that causes an enormous amount of greenhouse gas emissions. We know already that instead of coal, we can use hydrogen in order to turn iron ore into steel. But we have never really tried it at large scale. So this is one of the big tasks that on some of these industrial processes, we will have to test new technologies at scale. And that also will create what I would call lead markets in Europe, lead markets for green steel, lead markets for green steel technologies um, that we can then also sell to other parts of the world. So there is the clean, the clean steel breakthrough that we need to prepare for in the coming years. Another aspect is the whole issue around batteries. When we talk about mobility, electrification is one way forward. But that can only work if we have battery recycling and battery recycling that takes place in Europe. So we will propose new legislation for making battery recycling mandatory. There's very little happening at the present point in time in Europe on this. So that, again, is going to create a new value chain in Europe, recycling of batteries. So that will also help our industrial development, our development of the industry. All in all, if you want to have um, an efficient industry, you will really have to move industry towards a circular economy. I think that is the main um, motive, the main motto, the leitmotiv of the next industrial revolution. Uh, and that will start with some of the pro uh, processes I have been mentioning, but that will also have to have a look at waste. And it's not kind of end of the pipe treatment of waste, but it's also about how can you avoid waste and how can you make sure that the products we are consuming today last longer and they can also be repaired instead of being just thrown away. So there's many aspects that the coming commission wants to tackle in that area. Mobility, I've already mentioned several times. Uh, and again, here in terms of technologies, most of them are under development. And I think we'll see the first big moves when it comes to the segment of cars and the segment of vans in the coming years, where it's very clear if you want to achieve as automotive industry, the ambitious CO2 standards in Europe, you will have to move to zero or near zero emission vehicles in the future. And since the legislation was adopted a bit more than a year ago, we see massive investment into new factories across Europe in order to produce the cars. And I think in the coming months, you will see on many billboards new offers for cleaner cars in the coming years in order for us to meet the CO2 emission performance standards. But even here, as I said, we are not quite sure whether the standards we have been setting now for the year 2030 are going to be sufficient to reach our minus 55% target. So we will have to look at them again. For the other sectors, like maritime transport, that is not part of European legislation yet. We will look at how this could be included into the EU emissions trading system. We will also look at aviation, because aviation today gets a lot of free allowances in the emissions trading system, whether we can cut that, and aviation would have to pay for those allowances in the future. But in both sectors, the maritime sector and the aviation sector, in finally, the solution can only be sustainable fuels for those industries. And again, it is about lead markets for those fuels. I think we know how to produce these carbon-free uh, fuels for the future, but it is time to start developing the lead markets in Europe through mandates, for instance. If you want to provide new types of fuels, you also need to look at the infrastructure. Even with the rollout of electric cars, we need more charging points in Europe, and that's one of the very urgent things. So by 2025, Europe wants to help to um, get out one million new charging points. 
Um, that's about an eight-fold increase within the next five years. So that's also a big task that we will have to do together with other players, particularly also the finance sector, in order to mobilize sufficient private finance. Let's come now to the most sensitive sector in Ireland, or one of the most sensitive ones, that is agriculture. So also agriculture will have to make its contribution towards a climate neutral um, Europe in the year 2050. And what we are preparing at the present point in time is what is called a farm to fork strategy. So it's not looking at farms uh, any longer in isolation, but to look at the whole process from the farm through the food processing industry and how it gets onto the table of the consumer. And that not only with um, food, but also with other agriculture products to look at the entire value chain and what can be done. Again, this is a strategy that should come out in uh, spring this year and that would lay the ground for many measures in that area for the coming months. This will probably also include legislation to reduce the use of chemical pesticides, of fertilizers, and also antibiotics, uh, where, we have many where we see many negative environmental effects. Um, one of the big changes in the common agriculture policy for the coming years is that member states will be asked to draft common agriculture policy strategies, uh, where they are going to lay out how the money is going to be used that is going to be channeled via the common agriculture policy, and member states will have to define objectives uh, in terms of what should be accomplished with the means under the common agriculture policy. And again, this will have to be in line with the overall objective moving towards climate neutrality by the year 2050. Climate change is not the only issue we are looking at. The other thing, and I think that's also where um, I think even the farms are negatively affected, is biodiversity, which we see dwindling in Europe in big numbers, and not only in Europe, but also worldwide. And we need to have a biodiversity strategy that is going to be effective in the coming years in order to hold the loss of biodiversity, not only in Europe, but also elsewhere. That goes along also with a new forest strategy, and that will go along with looking at the value chains, chains that go even down to tropical forests. So these are very interesting areas where we need to make sure that through new action in those areas, we will be able to preserve and to restore ecosystems and biodiversity. Then coming to zero pollution, um, we have still enormous problems in many cities in Europe when it comes to the air quality. Uh, we have issues in terms of groundwater and water quality. And we also have issues when it comes to soil contamination, uh, which we would like to address during the course of the next commission. Um, that also is the industrial emissions from large industrial installations and chemicals that are produced in chemical industry. But <clears throat> all of this um, Green Deal is also going to contribute to the wider Commission strategy on the implementation of the UN 2030 Agenda, the Sustainable Development Agenda, where Sustainable de Development Goals have been set um, and that they need to be fulfilled. So also the Green Deal is going to become um, instrumental in order to get to those targets. Now there comes a very long slide, and I'm not, um, not going to go through that one by one, but what it shows is that from many different angles we will have to tackle the issue of financing. One is, of course, that we clean up our own budget in the European Union, uh, that a certain um, percentage is going to be spent on climate-relevant investments in the future, 
but another angle is to clean up the entire financing sector in order to be able to identify what are sustainable investments. Because all the savings you have in the banks and you want to put towards good use, it's very hard to know where do I find that good use. So over the last years, we have started with a taxonomy on sustainable finance. And I think that is going to be taken further in the coming years to make sure that people know how to use their money to the best effect for a sustainable Europe. That will also include, at the level of member states, green budgeting practices. Um, that will include green public procurement, because that's one of the ways you can make sure that cleaner products that might be a bit more expensive are going to be demanded in the market, and the government spending plays an enormous role in that respect. <clears throat> I mentioned already the tax reforms, uh, but another area that we need to look at urgently is the whole issue of state aid. Um, because what state aid needs to do is not only to create a single market in Europe, but it also needs to support the transformation process in the coming years. And we know that in the beginning, in many areas, we will need support from the public side for new investments and public uh, state aid um, rules should not prevent that from happening. Then I come to research and innovation. That is going to be key. I think I mentioned in all the different sectors how new technologies will be able to move forward. So the next program, Horizon Europe, for the next uh, seven years that is currently under preparation, has so-called Green Deal missions um, that are related to climate change, to oceans, to cities, and also to soils. And these will try to bring together public institutions with industry, with business circles, in order to move forward on the innovation agenda to make sure that we produce the innovation and the technologies that are required to get us to a climate neutral Europe in 2050. But it doesn't end there, because we also need to look at the education system uh, that needs to be changed, and we need to take measures in order to be able to implement the Green Deal in the coming decade. So also here, investment, for instance, into school infrastructure, but also reskilling and upskilling of the workforce in Europe is something that is going to be important. And I mentioned before the renovation wave the skills in the construction sector is certainly something we need to look at much more deeply in the coming years to make sure that the deep renovation is going to happen. Finally, we have to um, introduce a principle of do no harm. Because if we say, yes, 25% of the budget is going to be spent climate relevant, does it mean that the other 75% can be spent on anything else that goes into the total opposite direction. No, that should not be possible. Therefore, this principle of do no harm is something that needs to be established and put into legislation um, and into the whole process of lawmaking in Europe and I think also in member states. I'll spare you the next one, which talks about the trillion, but I'll come to the international aspects. Because even if Europe would become climate neutral by the year 2050, that doesn't guarantee that we have been able to fight successfully climate change and reaching the objectives of the Paris Agreement. So we will have to lead in the international negotiations on climate and also biodiversity. And not only in the negotiations, we also have to make sure that we help other countries implementing the necessary policies and investing in the right things. So practical cooperation is going to be very important in the coming decades. And I think you will see the first elements of that when we have the summit with Africa in the coming months, when we will have the summit with China in the coming months. My last point I want to make is that all of this is only going to be possible if we mobilize not only the people here in this room, 
but all the people outside the room as well. Uh, because this is such a big transformation uh, that will require everybody to buy into that and to play his or her part and the role in that big transformation in the coming years. Therefore, at the European level, we are going to launch what we will call a European Climate Pact in the coming months um, in order to mobilize civil society, in order to mobilize cities, communes, regions, business circles, um, farmers, agricultures, foresters, um, all of those who want to even move one step forward faster than the government to say, we are going to try to assist you in that process. And we would like you to inspire each other, learn from the good ideas you are implementing in different parts of Europe. So that could become a very important part of the implementation story. Um, because Brussels on its own, it's not going to happen. We need the population in Europe. And that brings me back to the overarching objectives. And now I'm looking forward to a good and interesting discussion and many questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, indeed for that stimulating and, and we, we can all sense in this room that we, we all were in this together, aren't we? I mean, the world is in this together. This. Um, so I will take questions. Can we have the lights up a little bit so that we can all see? Now oh, that's so much oh, yeah. more comfortable. Now you see the intelligent people you've been addressing and how inspired they are. Did, have you learned something today that you didn't know this morning? Um. I can't talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we might come back to, to that because, you, yes, I'll, yes, I'll, I'll favor somebody who has the microphone and can wave that at me, as it were, because then we'll get through everything a bit quicker, yes. Hi, my name is Harriet Walsh, and I'm just wondering uh, what do you think about the criticism that has faced the Green New Deal? A lot of people have said it focuses too much on the economics and endless growth rather than the building of communities. And Can you speak a little slower and, you know, a little slower, yeah. Um, okay. Uh, I'm just wondering what do you think of the criticism of the Green New Deal? People have said it's a lot of deregulation and unwarranted... Un, um, unendless growth of the economy, and I'm just wondering if you think that's accurate because there isn't as much focus on community. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm going to take that. Um, to be honest, I'm quite proud in terms of this strategy because it tries to particularly look at the social elements as well. Um, if you look back at many strategies we had in the past, uh, there was much less uh, attention given to these things. And I think when I say uh, don't leave anybody behind, that is, I think, what the Commission means. And one of the first proposals that landed on the table <clears throat> only two weeks ago, even during the course of the budget discussions, is to have a fair transition mechanism um, in the whole Green Deal in order to make sure that those regions that are going to be particularly um, have big challenges in terms of the transformation and the change are go going to be accompanied to find kind of the new future for them. So that's one side. But then there's also, um, I think, that what you call the social side uh, in terms of a lot of these things will require social learning um, and will require communities, municipalities, to do things together in a different way than uh, what was done in the past. And that, I think, is going to be particularly addressed through the Climate Pact. Um, but I don't want to be seen, or Brussels does, doesn't want to be seen, that you can steer that all from Brussels. I think what we need is um, a lot of backing in member states' capitals, but also in member states' regions, because they are the agents of change at the end of the day, uh, what we can do from Brussels is kind of stimulate a little bit and push it a little bit forward, but most of that will have to happen on the ground um, with yeah, what you call the grassroots. Yes. 
Doctor, thanks. A um, couple of points. First of all, um, I'm, I'm representing the investment side, so I founded ESG Ireland, and I know you mentioned on the education front that we need to do a lot more. And um, one of the things that I'm trying to do is close the knowledge gap around the integration of environmental, social, and governance factors in the decision-making process. And I think the governments actually need to do a lot more in terms of empowering people to provide that education. So it's all well and good in saying we'll fund sustainable companies, but to get funding to move, move education efforts forward isn't really happening. So that's one thing to consider. The second uh, thing is that on the private side, they say we need a coordinated response from government. On the government side, we say we need a coordinated response from the private side. So that's a conundrum we need to deal with because anytime that anyone says we're going to have more government regulation or we're going to play, put in more rules, they're painted as a socialist. Look at Bernie Sanders or, or people even in Ireland or whatever. And the final point I'd like to say is in the Green Deal, it mentions climate leakage. So Europe can say we'll put all these rules in place, but then the European companies or the US companies or whoever maybe can go down to Latin America or whatever region, I only mention Latin America because I've been there for more than two years, and they can abide by much softer rules or, in worst case scenarios, corrupt local governments and forget about the people on the ground. So what I would say is that it's all one yeah, do thing. Do we hear a question coming? I think we see the question. There's three, just, there's three yeah. points there. So I would like to see what's going to be done on an education front to fund new initiatives, education initiatives. Two, this conundrum between private and public. And three, how do you stop companies from Europe or in or North America or wherever not abiding by the rules, the same rules that would apply in Europe, in Latin America? Thank you. Take that. Yes. Um, I think on the, on the education side, I, I showed some of the things. Again, um, if you look at education, probably Brussels is not the best place to solve all the problems when it comes to education. It's very much what national governments are going to do. Um, what we can help with in, at the European level when it comes to education is a lot in terms of learning from each other. And that is, I think, something we want to establish, these platforms where we can show what are the curricula that can work and that really make progress in certain areas. Um, as when you come to the public-private coordination, uh, I think finance is going to help in that area. Uh, and I think um, I didn't show that slide. Um, it is very clear that with the limited amount of public money we have, we are not going to solve the problem. So we will have to um, match funding public and private. In actual fact, we should use as little public money in order to mobilize as much private money. And that is where then the coordination in terms of investment is going to happen. That's one thing. The other thing is the regulatory side that you say, OK, can you determine what is a sustainable investment? And to make that clear to the financing sector so that you push more and more money into that direction. On your third question, I think we are very clear in Europe that shuffling carbon around the world is not going to work. Um, and that is something we need to prevent. At the current point in time, we do that very much by yeah, giving free certificates under the emissions trading system to industry in order to reduce the pressure. But if we are going to step up our um, the measures in Europe, we will have to do much more. And it's a combination. It's a combination of what you do at the border. It's a combination. It's then you need to have something to create demand for cleaner products in Europe. First of all, you need to be able to see on the shelf what is a cleaner product, what is a cleaner car, what is not a clean car, what is clean steel, what is not clean steel, what is clean cement, what is not clean cement. Um, and then you need to have the public in particular starting to buy these things. So when we build hospitals, uh, when we build schools, that we use sustainable materials and not the materials that were produced in a dirty way. I think that is the way forward to create these lead markets I was talking about. But they could also be more expensive. The steel could be more expensive as well? Yes. No, the steel will be more expensive. Yeah. Um, but kind of there's calculations that say, Okay, if the car industry would use 
this clean steel, which is going to be a bit more expensive, then you might pay, I don't know, 100, 200 euros more per car. So is that not, um, is, is that amount of money uh, not worth spending? I would think yes. But that will only happen if you oblige all car companies to do it in that way. So I think that is something where we need to get to uh, in the medium term. That might not be the first step, but that is where you need to get to in the longer term. But all of this is going to be extremely difficult to deliver, isn't it? No, I'm not saying that it, this is easy. Yeah. Um, kind of everybody who leaves the room and says, Mr. Rungemetzger said it's easy peasy, you are wrong. This is one of the biggest things that we need to do in the next 30 years. And 30 years, by the way, is a very short period of time. Most of you in the room, you still remember the fall of the Iron Curtain. That's 30 years ago. That is like, uh, it was yesterday. That quickly, yes. We have a question from outside the room, I think. Um, Sabrina Decker, have you got the question, Sabrina? We have, sorry, we have about four questions. Four, we'll take, we'll take them serially, but take the first one first, and then I'll go to the audience and come back to you for another one, yeah. So question one from Tara Smith. The first slide showed climate impacts, but the focus was on mitigation. Do we know how much investment is needed to prepare Europe for climate impacts? Where will it come from? Will binding adaptation targets be part of the European climate law? Okay. Um, when it comes to climate impacts and the amount of money you need to spend on adaptation, um, I think these are all very rough numbers. Um, they go into the hundreds of millions. Um, but it's very hard to pin it down to numbers as you can do with reducing emissions, where you talk about specific technologies. Um, because also, when you come to adaptation, the question is, what world are you going to adapt to? And it's changing so rapidly. Now one degrees in a couple of years, 1.5 in 2050, 2070, two degrees. So it also depends on your investment you are doing. Is it an investment that will last for five years, for 10 years, for 20 years, or for even longer? So that is, I think, something where we have rough calculations. We know it costs, it's going to cost a lot of money, um, but we don't have exact numbers on that. Yes. Yep, with the microphone, yeah. Hi. Uh, sorry, my name is uh, Cynthia Mahani, and I have a, a question. My question is, you talk about um, you know, the fall of the Iron Curtain, the end of World War II, and the difference between those, um, those things and with the Green New Deal is we had an ideological partner with the US, in, in the US, and so now we don't have the support of, uh, of America in terms of they, you know, they, um, Trump has pulled out of the Paris Agreement. He's dismantling environmental regulations, making it easier for their industry to, to basically do what they want. Where for Europe, with the Green New Deal, it's going, you know, the transition period is going to be very difficult for taxpayers and for industry. So how do you um, make sure that Europe stays competitive um, against the U.S. to make sure that you know, the economy is still growing and able to produce jobs for, for people during that transition period? Mm -hmm. I think, first of all, I don't think it is that black and white as you are portraying it. Uh, because what we also see in the United States is a lot of climate action that is still being taken by states, by municipalities, uh, by companies producing goods that are cleaner than other things. Um, and I think that is something that is going to reduce also greenhouse gas emissions in the United States. Um, on the other part, how do we make sure that Europe will stay competitive? Is because we are going to invest into the things that will be needed in the future. Uh, and we want to be the first ones producing those. And every time, yes, there is a learning curve, and in the beginning it's going to be more expensive. I think we have learn learned our lesson with wind technologies. They were awfully expensive, if you look 20 years back, and they were compared to the technologies we have today, very inefficient. But over time, with learning, we have made them much more effective, much more efficient, and they can pay for their own business. If you look at how much money is invested in wind energy, uh, and you can use other examples where this is also happening. 
So everybody who wants to be the first mover is always going to pay a price for that in the beginning. It's an investment. So that is going to help you to be competitive. And others in the world are not sleeping. Uh, I was in China at a big conference on electric mobility. I tell you, there's a lot of investment going into that area. So there's even the risk that Europe is going to lose a couple of industries if we are not um, also moving ahead in the coming years in the different sectors. And am I right in thinking that the Danes were first in on wind energy with turbines and so on? It's not only, not only it was maybe the very first ones yeah. was, uh, were the companies in Denmark, but we saw many companies building up in Germany, in Spain, even American companies who were developing their wind business in Europe. Uh, because the conditions were favorable, and they also have a cutting edge today in terms of that technology. Right. Yes, uh, somebody with the microphone here. Yep. Hello, um, my name is Bobby Lambert. Um, you, my question is relating to bringing people with us, not the people in the room, because we're already here, but bringing lots of people who feel, who hear the stories of gloom and doom, mm -hmm. who hear the stories about cost, who hear the stories about pain and steel being more expensive and all of this. This is not a mobilizing narrative. Uh, if you think of uh, an American example, I have a dream, Martin Luther King, that sort of I have a dream for a better society, I think it needs to be much more to the fore. We see that in the election here in Ireland. That, that a lot of the discussion is about avoiding the, the catastrophes and about the pain of doing this, and even the term just transition implies some sort of painful process. So what is being done to look at a much more positive narrative in ten, terms of a dream of actually a much better world that people then will, will easily flock to and support? It'd be nice to hear something about that. I'm sorry to hear that I was misunderstood so much. <laughs> because I think what I was painting up here was a vision of a world in 2050 that is going to have cleaner air, a vision of a world in 2050 that probably will have quieter cities, um, a vision of a world in 2050 that will have better food, uh, a vision of a world in 2050 uh, that will have very comfortable houses. Um, so I'm not quite sure what you're talking about. And when we talk about cost, I think what we are talking about is a modernization of Europe that has to happen over the coming 30 years, and that will require investment. And we shouldn't shy away from telling the truth and saying, look, you need first to invest in something if you want to harvest something in a couple of years' time. So I don't think that I'm the one who is the doom and gloom prayer. Um, of course, we also need to take into account what happens if we do not act on climate change. I think that is something we need to keep uh, in, our, in the back of our mind. But I think the questioner also has a point that the narrative is very often negative. This is going to cost more, yeah. it's going to be painful, you've got to change your ways. What are you going to do about it? So I, there's a, there is an amount, an amount of yeah. pessimism and di difficulty. I, th I think it's, it's not an amount of pessimism. I think um, this gets into the politics of the day. And I think the challenge we have as a societies in Europe um, is populism at the moment. And it's very clear that the populists, uh, hopefully they're out of the room, um, they will use this in order to exactly uh, put forward those arguments. And you can see that already today, that many of the populist parties are saying, oh, you want to forbid our stake on the plate. You want to forbid us to go fast with our cars. You want to forbid us to do this or that. So it's painted in a very negative way. And the only thing I can see forward is a democratic discourse on saying, no, that's not what we are saying, very clearly. Um, we think that the world is going to be shinier and nicer in the future if we go down that pathway. It's a sustainable world we are moving towards to. 
if you want to pursue the business as usual, I think the outlook is much grimmer. Sabrina, have you another question from? A few more questions, so could I give you two? Go on. Um, the first one is from Greg Beechnor. Can we realistically climate-proof the common agricultural policy, or should it be scrapped and we start again? How will the climate and agriculture sections of the Commission and Council work together on this if they have competing demands and audiences? The first one. Then the following question from Sion O'Rafferty is... No, let's stay on, on CAP, okay. because it's a discrete question and it's hugely central and important, yeah. Should it be scrapped and should we start again? Yeah. I think one thing is very clear. If you look at the graph that I showed in the beginning, um, there will be emissions from agriculture even in the year 2050. Um, and we will have to balance those emissions. So that is the task. On one side, try to reduce further, and you can do that by, for instance, investing into agriculture that is precision agriculture. So you use all the inputs in a much more um, effective and efficient way. Um, secondly, um, we can try to enhance the capacity to suck up carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, having higher soil fertility even with that, because you increase the organic matter of the soils. Um, you can look at substituting materials that at the present point in time are produced from oil, for instance, in the chemical industry. You can use feedstocks that come from agriculture. Um, you will be able to um, use building materials from forestry or also from agriculture when it comes to insulation materials. So there is a lot of added value agriculture can offer and forestry in the future. And I think the, the picture we are painting of agriculture is not that agriculture is going to produce less in the year 2050. No, it's going to produce more and also a much bigger variety of products. It's not only food production in 2050, food of which we will need more and we will need to use it more effectively and reduce food waste and so on because we have so many more people to feed in the year 2050. But we'll also have agriculture um, in, in terms of the bioeconomy producing things uh, that can help us in other industrial processes or in the construction industry. Uh, or when it also comes to fuels, biogas um, and biofuels is also an area um, where you can make headway and help in the fight against climate change. Uh, and I think these are the things that also the common agriculture policy should support in the coming years. Uh, and finally, I think one big question is the whole issue about adaptation to climate change. Because we see that many farmers are struggling um, with the changing climate. We see many forests um, that probably with the current um, uh, range of species that are planted on that particular uh, hectare are not going to survive the next 40 years. So it will also require new investment in the forest to make sure that we will have forest in 40, 50 years time. So I think there's an, um, a lot of activity that will have to be supported in both agriculture and forestry. Okay, here, yes. Good evening, Doctor. Um, my name is Jerry Kiersey of the Irish Road Hodge Association. I operate trucks. Um, Professor King of Aston University said in this room about three years ago that our goal would be the sum of many, many small things. Mm -hmm. In 2005, I and a number of others succeeded in running our trucks on a fuel produced in Irish fields, which is called rapeseed oil. Thanks to the scare from ILOC and the deforestation of Indonesia and everything else, the EU introduced a policy that blanketly killed off everything we do, or everything we were doing in this country. What I'm very concerned about is I keep hearing about these grand plans, but they are not locally based. Europe is not one amalgus country. It is 27 states, well, 26 now. But we in Ireland are a green country with our own potential solutions. Rapeseed oil, produced in the manner in which we were doing it, meets so many of the requirements you talked about. Carbon capture, reduction in, in fertilizer, runoff, all the other things, and it's renewable. 
my point is that if you think in blanket terms without thinking locally, you kill those of us that have some initiative and want to do something that's a bit different. Thank you. Thank you. So you got that question? Um, kind of if I understood it correctly, it's about biofuels, rapeseed, and tropical deforestation. Um, this is a difficult policy area, uh, which Europe has been struggling with over the last years. What we have introduced in Europe is sustainability criteria for fuels that are being sourced from outside, and they look particularly at the question of deforestation. Um, and then I think there is a commitment to look particularly into the issues around palm oil in the coming years, uh, to make sure that we source it from really sustainable sources and not through large deforestation of uh, natural forests. Um, I think that is something that we want to do, and I think we want even to go further, not only look at biofuels, but also at other agricultural commodities uh, like soybeans, like beef, um, like some of the other things that, where we are a big importer into Europe in order to see what's the carbon footprint of those. Um, so there is a lot of work that is coming ahead in the coming years on this one, because again, that is not an easy question to answer and to regulate. But one of his questions was, does one size fit all? Or no. are there not separate parts of Europe where they may have oh, best yeah. practice and work something? No, no, I think when, it, when you talk about agriculture, of course, it depends on where you are in terms of what your comparative advantage is. Um, I don't think that there is a single farming system that applies to every part in Europe. Um, if you look at the stress the agriculture system will be under in the coming years, particularly in the Mediterranean area because of drought and heat, um, that will have to be developed in quite a different way from what we see today. Uh, we will have to increase water use efficiency in, those, in agriculture in particular all across Europe. But the solution in the end, of course, will have to be specific for each location when it comes to agriculture and forestry. Yes. Ah. Thank you. Hello. I'm Gail Leimer from uh, University College Dublin. I have uh, two very short questions. Well, I'll take one only because we have 20 questions in the room, so just uh, one. All right, okay, so it's going to be one question and one remark. Uh, you mentioned investment that will create growth. And for my research, I attended many events like this one where people mention growing. Can we actually consider a slight degrowing, a degrowth? For example, this room is gorgeous, but do we, mean, do we need all these lights that change nothing to your speech tonight? And my remark is that tomorrow is Friday and many kids will uh, strike in the streets in Dublin, like every Friday. And I agree that your speech is not super optimistic in some ways, like this gentleman over there, over there said. So are you confident in this plan to say to the kids, don't worry, Europe is in charge, we, we will do that? Thank you. You see, if I would say yes to that, I would, it's like assuming and believing in the benevolent dictator. Um, I think what we are offering uh, in terms of the Green Deal uh, in Europe is that this is something that we will have to do together. So also with the kids that go into the streets on Friday. Um, I think one of the big discussions um, is always around, okay, does it mean more or less growth? Um, and I think if we look at it from our end, what we see in terms of the investment that is required, that is going to create growth in terms of economic growth and it's going to create jobs in the coming years. It's still a very different way the economy is going to be run. Um, very different from what we see today. So therefore, it is a major transformation that is required. And that will require change. change in terms of how people are going to drive, what modes of transport they are going to take, what types of cars they are going to buy, what types of things they are buying for their households. Um, I think that will still have to change, and there we will need to take everybody with us because that is the uh, rational way forward. But you're, you're rational, and you want to bring them forward. Mm -hmm. But cost and price is a very big factor yeah. in a lot of people's decision making. So how are you going to manage to manage that? Look, 
the thing is always, and you are falling into that same trap, that you say, okay, an investment is a cost, and that is going to reduce my wealth in one way or the other. But that is not the case in reality. If you invest in something, it's going to bear some fruit. And in some cases, this investment is even going to lead to lower cost. Look at, for instance, the vehicle standards that we are devising in Europe. Improving efficiency of the engine by 37.5% over a period of nine years. And if you then look at what does it cost the person who buys the car and who runs the car, the analysis clearly shows that it's going to be cheaper transport for everybody who buys that transport. And I think the, the, the biggest win we see, because it's the first time we have been regulating, is, is for trucks. If you look at trucks and we improve the efficiency of trucks by 30% by the year 2030, that is the current legislation that has been adopted, um, you will save on the fuel bill around 12,000 euros. And that's a lot of money for a small operator of a lorry. So to assume that everything is a cost and will lead to you are getting poorer and poorer, that's incorrect. Because in many areas, we will use things much more efficiently. I, I showed you the, um, well, no, I told you about um, in terms of the energy consumption. If we electrify the economy much more than what we did in the past, it means that overall we will re reduce the amount of energy, primary energy, that goes into the system. So we make the system more efficient, and that is going to save us a lot of money in terms of our fuel bill. So it's not only about cost. I think that is a complete misconception here. And I think what we try in Brussels before we come out with regulation is always to look at this aspect. What's the cost, and also what's the cost for the individual consumer um, if we introduce a certain um, measure? So I think that is something we put a particular, or cast a particular eye on, in order to make sure that we are not robbing the citizen, but that uh, at the end of the day, the citizen is going to gain, and the consumer is going to gain. Yes, um, just Mike, you. My, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, Somebody my, with the microphone first. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry, the question relates to the costs and the benefits. Um, so is there an analysis done on the costs against the benefits? Because that is very important in decision making within the whole strategy. And the other question is about the opportunity cost of missing this opportunity, because it is actually a race against another global uh, group. Like, like China will be doing this if Europe doesn't do it. So it's a competitive advantage for us to be ahead. So, but there are numbers all around that that would be very interesting to know what they are. And it's certainly on the benefit side, because there's multiple benefits around health, mobility, efficiency. They are the, that's the narrative of this as well for industry, um, which will switch them onto this. And the other side is the consumer side, and that's about behavioral change. And that's actually a campaign that doesn't exist yet. There are my two comments. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I, I didn't get that. D didn't get that. She's so, sort of sorry, it's just benefit, really the about the cost and the benefit, benefits of the strategy. If there are figures around that within the document or in the commission, or maybe you, know, you have some knowledge about that, that was it really. Costs and benefits around the strategy. Um, yes, we look at kind of when we did the underlying strategy for Europe becoming climate neutral, we look at costs and benefits. Um, the difficulty there is how do you quantify the cost of inaction? That is one of the areas where it gets very difficult. So even the graph I've shown you in terms of the GDP and which showed three lines, one of which was business as usual, they all assume that there is no cost to inaction. Um, and that is it's mentioned in the graph as the big caveat um, that is so difficult to quantify. Uh, and very easily, yeah, you get into the issue of it's doom or gloom. But even if we don't take that into account, what you will see is that um, the two lines, business as usual or with climate action, they are so close to each other 
uh, that you would ask, yeah, that's even an insurance policy uh, for myself in order to ensure the economy in the future against the costs of climate action. In action, sorry. Yes. Here, yes. Yeah. Yeah. You're very welcome. You're bringing down the average age of the questioner. So Thank you. You're most welcome. My name is Liam Kilmore, and uh, you've seen it in uh, all of Europe, in the Eastern European countries, more specifically in Poland and the far-right populist government there. And you've also seen it within the farmers in Germany and more specifically here as well. And so my question to you is, why do you think these people who've probably read the Green New Deal, have probably seen the new Green New Deal, even people who've seen over Green New Deal specifically in America and reject this because it's not, um, it's not pushing hard enough that it's not doing enough. Why do you think these people are reluctant to accept the Green New Deal? Um, I'm, I'm not as optimistic as you. I don't think that many people have read documents of the Commission. Um, so unfortunately, I, I always come across that. Um, but what is happening in terms of the farmers um, at the present point in time? I think also I'm a German and um, many of my relatives are farmers. Um, I think there is a, a, a big disappointment uh, in the farming community because somehow they feel being pushed aside. Um, and I think also when you look, you mentioned Poland. Um, what is happening there is that, yes, it's clear that we would have to move out of coal. And 80% of the electricity generation in Poland is still based on electricity. Um, so there's many people who are fearing for the loss of their jobs. Um, what we have established over the last years is a platform uh, for coal-based regions in order to start talking to them and to see how can we transform the local economy, the regional economy, away from just depending on the next coal pit. Um, and I think that is showing um, first successes. Um, because first of all, we are not starting with moving out of coal in Poland. This has started many years ago. They have closed many coal pits uh, in southern Poland over many years, and they have transformed some of these areas into yeah, new industries into service sectors, uh, and that we need to continue in the coming years. Um, so you need to offer assistance and help understanding uh, to those regions across Europe, and I think that is what is also part of the Green Deal when we talk about the just transition. So you should not ignore uh, what is happening, but you need to um, move towards the people uh, and take them with you, explain to them, uh, and even if they haven't read what's all in the Green Deal. How influential do you think children have been in this debate, including small behaviours and addressing their parents and introducing their parents to, the, to this agenda? And I think um, over the last two years, uh, the Fridays for Future movement and other movements have been very instrumental in order to get the politicians to move um, and to change the objectives. Um, I think we are now getting to the really critical part where everything that has been written on paper, we also need to implement into reality. And for that, we will need many hands, and particularly of the young generation, because it requires engineers, it requires um, knowledgeable farmers, um, so everybody can roll up the sleeves and help in order to move forward. Um, I think that is what is ahead of us in the coming years. Uh, if we leave this aside and this paper is going to gather just dust on the shelf, um, I think we are not going to do ourselves a favor um, in this whole process. But I believe that society is waking up in Europe, uh, moving towards into that direction. And that is also true for Poland. Poland has accepted uh, at the meeting of the Council in December that Europe should move to become climate neutral by the year 2050. How much damage do you think Donald Trump has done to this agenda? 
I think he has done most damage to his own country, probably, because he is stopping um, uh, innovation in certain areas. Um, he is stopping um, investments that have been laid down by private sector in order to clean up the economy. Uh, and I think that in the medium and long term, uh, it will make the United States uh, less competitive compared to Europe. Uh, internationally, uh, what you can see is that, yeah, it's, um, uh, there's some leaders who follow the same logic, the same thinking. I think we, if you look at Brazil, uh, what is happening there, that's a complete change of the policy re with respect to climate change uh, that is happening at the present point in time. So he has a damaging effect internationally on the politics. And I think that's also what you probably see in the international climate negotiations, that there's more and more who start saying, uh, as we had it also during Bush times, um, that if the United States is not moving, why should we as a poorer country in the world move at all? Uh, it is really for the rich countries to take their responsibility uh, and to set an example and to move forward first. And I think that's what we want to do. We want to use the power of the example to say it's possible. Um, kind of when I started on climate negotiations internationally, one thing you heard time and again was we can either eradicate poverty in our countries or we can fight climate change. And I think in Europe what we are showing is we can reduce emissions and at the same time we can grow our economy in a sustainable manner. And that has changed the discourse over the last uh, 10 to 15 years, and it has changed the discourse, particular with the big developing countries, whether it is China, whether it's Mexico, South Africa, India, um, Indonesia, you name it. There's also something, I'm, I just have one other small point I want to make, to, which I know I've made in this debate, in this lecture before. I often think that the vanity of the multinationals, their corporate social responsibility, and their need to impress their customers and so on, is a huge factor. And I use the word vanity, yeah. You... I think what we see happening uh, with many big companies is that they are turning around and that they are trying to clean up their um, supply chains, uh, whether it is food processing industry. Uh, but what we also see and what we hear is uh, that that might not be sufficient. Um, some and many of them are saying, we need a little more help from the side of government in terms of regulatory approaches uh, to, uh, in order to move this in a much faster fashion than what we do right now. Yes. Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Jack O'Sullivan. Firstly, I, I think your lecture was extraordinarily integrative, comprehensive, and positive. You mentioned um, that agriculture should produce building materials. You mentioned waste. You mentioned the circular economy. The question I have integrates these. In Europe and in Ireland, cement plants burn large amounts of perfectly good um, recyclable materials, mm -hmm. primarily plastics and paper. And they do so because they get a financial advantage as these are considered to be renewable resources. As a result, it makes recycling more difficult. Is the EU going to change its policy on declaring certain kinds of waste renewable? And this is, if they do this, it will be much better. And coming back to your point about agriculture, if we can make ex cement more expensive and wood for building cheaper, wood is the best way to lock up carbon for 30 years. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Starting with your second question first, I think this is what is happening uh, because what we have been seeing over the last 24 months in Europe is a quintupling of the carbon price and uh, cement production uh, will have to pay a carbon price. Uh, so from that point of view, cement has become more expensive than in the past to the advantage of wood uh, and that is going to continue in the future because the cap under the ETS is going to decline further and further in the coming years. Um, on the second question, in terms of the waste streams, yes, that is one of the big tasks um, in the coming years to see how we can avoid waste as much as possible and how can we 
um, use what is today called waste as a new resource, as a raw material for production processes. Uh, one of the areas that we are going to look at um, in the coming months is particularly the construction sector because it is using a lot of material uh, for building houses and uh, the things that in the end if you dismantle a house uh, are still going to be usable. Look at the glass for instance, flat glass um, which is very high quality glass for windows um, where you will see recycling but most of that goes into bottles. Uh, and that is not useful. You, we could better use it for producing the next round of flat glass, uh, something that is probably even better in terms of insulation uh, against loss of uh, heat of houses. So yeah. there we will have to yeah. take steps. I take two final questions, one from uh, Sabrina and then I have a gentleman over here. Yes, Sabrina. Okay, so this question is from Callum Swift. Callum would like to know how the European Green Deal plans to reduce emissions from the healthcare sector. From the healthcare sector. Wow. I'm <laughs> um, I think that that is. Um, I, I need to f just go through my brains and see what are the emissions of the healthcare sector. Um, I think it's, I'm probably right in saying that um, there is relatively limited uh, emissions coming uh, with healthcare. Uh, one particular area I'm aware of um, is, for instance, the use of narcotics. Some of the narcotics are greenhouse gases. Um, so we have a regulation in Europe um, that we want to expand in future in order to then also look at this type of narcotics. Uh, when I look at the health sector, um, one area, and we haven't been speaking about that, and I'm really surprised that it hasn't come up in the discussion, um, is the way we as people consume food. Um, because what is very clear is that, um, and we did some calculations in our long-term strategy, uh, if you just would abide everybody of us to the kind of what is called under WHO standards as a healthy meal and would consume that, that would reduce the carbon footprint of our consumption, our nutrition, quite dramatically. Um, and we would do it even with a better health out outcome at the end of the day, which then also would reduce emissions that come from the healthcare sector. Um, so I think there's uh, different ways of looking at that. And you did mention that, the farm to fork, and the yeah. knowledge of that, the, the, the food chain, where it's coming from, how seasonal, how local, how much are we, that is going to the we'll farmer as opposed to, yeah. to the in, in, in between people. Yes, we have a final, a final question. I know there are a lot of questions in the room, but... Okay, thank you. My name is David Timoney from University College Dublin. About 10 years ago, I established a master's degree program in energy systems engineering with a view to educating people to understand the complex interdisciplinary issues here and to try to come up with solutions. And, you know, I've had some hundreds of graduates and that's, that's all very good. But um, I do find myself frustrated constantly by the way carbon emissions are accounted for all the incentives seem to be to move the problem to somebody else. I mean, in Ireland, we have a big plan to uh, electrify transport, but we can happily ignore the, the manufacturing of batteries or indeed their later recycling. The same way we're producing beef here and exporting it and we, we take the hit. We're running data centers that, you know, we're... Um, would it be practical for each nation to keep track of the embedded carbon crosses boundaries in materials and indeed in, in electricity. Is, is that something that would be possible? I think it would be helpful to national governments to decide good policy if that accounting were more honest. Thank you. I think that this is a very important issue. Um, and I think uh, what we try in Europe is to be comprehensive when it comes to legislation. Um, so when you talk, for instance, about the production of batteries, um, as long as this is done in Europe, of course it will fall under the emissions trading system, so the emissions are going to be accounted for. 
uh, and they will have a price, a carbon price, uh, and that will have an impact to make sure that even the battery production is going to be as efficient as possible and will reduce the carbon footprint of that. Um, a lot of the energy that is being used um, will come in future from clean sources, so that will also reduce the carbon footprint of battery manufacturing. Um, when it comes to the whole question then about embedded carbon, I think that is um, something that we will have to look at in particular when we look at this carbon uh, border adjustment mechanism. Um, and we know that this is not an easy question uh, because there is one piece of legislation where we try to regulate that even. Uh, that is what is called the fuel quality directive. Uh, what we tried in that piece of legislation is to say we look at all the emissions from the well up to the point when the fuel leaves the refinery uh, to capture all the emissions along the trail. Uh, as soon as this was adopted, um, we were told by industry um, we can't measure um, because we are buying um, oil that is mixed with oil from Nigeria or from the Russian Federation or from Canada. So all this goes together, so it's practically impossible to calculate the footprint. Um, I think this is something that we will have to address. The data centers is something that we will also look at in the next round of legislation. I'm not sure whether it was on the screen somewhere, but it is one of the areas where we uh, want to act. Uh, of course, in Europe, if these data centers are in Europe and they consume electricity, um, that electricity production falls again under the emissions trading system. Um, kind of the way the system is currently designed, as I said, we will be out of carbon emissions in the electricity system by 2040. So by then you should have clean electricity also for data centers. Um, a number of them are already trying to do this today by having their own power generation or buying their own power from clean sources. So I think uh, we are on the right way there. The problem has been identified, and I think even the companies who run these data centers want to change it. And of course, one of the issues is also that uh, they cause a lot of heat, um, and to use that heat um, in, for instance, the building sector to heat homes uh, is something that is a good way forward, which means we need to think of where do we locate those data centers in the future to put them far away, I think then you are going to lose the heat to the atmosphere, which is not useful. Finally, you are, I think, optimistic. Are you? I am. <laughs> are you saying you're an optimist by nature or that you're optimistic? No, I, once I was called a professional optimist. <laughs> and is that a useful thing in your job, given your challenge? Um, you see, I'm optimistic because uh, I have to look into so many technical details and that gives me hope for a lot of optimism that I think we will be able to solve that issue. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and thank you for being such a good audience. And thanks to the audio for the lovely music they played as we were waiting for the event to start. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.